Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Church Online at Trinity. My name is Tony Diekman. I am the site pastor here at Trinity Green Trails, and it's my privilege today to host you in worship along with the worship team from Trinity Green Trails. We are in the ninth week of the series we've titled The Tender Commandments, where we've been looking at those commandments that God gave Moses at Mount Sinai. Today, we're looking at the commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Our teaching pastor today is Mark Schultz. Well, if you're new and you found us for the very first time today online, I want to say a special welcome to you. And right now in the chat room, that's that little bar like thing, right? And then buttons like right down there. If you press on that button, it says I'm new here. It's a place for you to share your information with us. And we would love to connect with you this week. Uh, we would love to pray with you this week. Uh, and all you need to do is click that button right there to let us know that you're here. We'd love to know that. Also today, if you're back and you've come back to online worship, a special welcome to you. Last weekend, we were online, but we were also outdoors at all four of our sites around Chicagoland. And we will be again next weekend, as well as the 23rd of August. And it was a great time outside last weekend. It was a little warm, but what a great breeze and what an awesome time to worship the Lord and see so many people face to face. It was a great time. Today, we are hosting here at Trinity Green Trails, and it is a communion weekend. So if you're planning to participate in communion today, I would say get your elements ready. If you want to know more about that, communion will happen a little bit later in the service. If you want to know more about that, go to our website, tlcforyou.org forward slash communion, and you can read up a little bit about that and uh, learn more what we practice and what we believe about communion. Well, as we begin, I would love to open the service with prayer. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father in heaven, we gather in the name of Jesus. It's in his name that we are called here today. Your spirit has brought us to this place, this place online, where we can gather around your word, around your sacraments to worship and praise you and have you minister to us in this time. Father, we do pray that you would minister to our hearts, that you would mold and shape our hearts into the image of your Son. I pray that you would work through the words that Mark has prepared for us today, that his words would be your words, that the music that we worship to today would bring you glory. Father, we seek to honor you in all that we say, think, and do. We offer up this time and our lives to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship. Oh, it's free. 
Trinity. I'm so glad that you are worship, worshiping with us today. We're going to continue on in our service by thinking about the Lord's holiness and splendor. So this is excerpts from Psalm 89. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength, and by your favor you exalt our home. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel.
a holy God. Thank you for being bigger than all of our problems, than all of the struggles in our world. Thank you for giving us peace. Thank you for giving us strength. Thank you for being so holy. Amen. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 25 and 32 through 34. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome again to our series called The Tender Commandments. And again, we're looking at the Ten Commandments together, but we're calling them the Tender Commandments because they are gifts to us from a loving God that wants us to know how to live our lives to their fullest, to the best. And this week, we turn our attention to this commandment, uh, Exodus 20, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is the Eighth Commandment. Now, right up front, I want to tell you, I think this may be the hardest commandment for us to keep, especially in our world today. But I can also tell you, if everyone would just keep this commandment the way God intends, all of our lives would be dramatically better. I think you'll see what we mean as we dig into this commandment a little today. Now, I also want to share with you Martin Luther's explanation for this commandment. Luther has been explaining these in the small catechism, and we've been looking at those explanations together. And this is what Luther says. He says, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. Now, you may be wondering, where does Luther get these explanations? Because it seems like sometimes they say a lot more than the commandment itself says. Well, what Luther is doing is he's taking a look at the commandment, but then he's taking a look at the underlying principles that we find all throughout Scripture about that commandment. And so Luther isn't just giving us the commandment himself, but in a way he's giving us Scripture's commentary on that commandment, the, the principles that are uh, in God's moral law for all people, all time, that we find in that commandment that was given to a specific people, the children of Israel, as they were led out of slavery in Egypt. Now, before we dive into what Luther explained, what Scripture says about this commandment, I'd ask you to bow your heads and pray together with me. Lord, I pray that the words I'm about to speak and the thoughts that we think as we meditate on your word for us today, Lord, I pray that that would all be truly acceptable in your sight. 
O God, who is our rock and our redeemer, who has given us these commandments out of love so that we can live lives to the fullest. Amen. The story is told uh, that many, many years ago in a, in a Jewish village, one of the men from the village came to the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, um, I, I need you to help me understand something. Um, I, I need to understand that it, it seems like words are very powerful, um, but I don't understand why. You know, it, words can't hurt me, but why does it seem like what people say um, can sting so much sometimes? And the rabbi said, I actually have a good answer for you, but I want you to do something for me first before I give you that answer. He said, I want you to go home and I want you to find an old feather pillow in your house. And I want you to carefully open one end of it. And then I want you to go around our village and I want you to take one little feather out of that pillow and set it on the doorstep of each house in our village. And, and the guy said, Rabbi, why do you want me to do that? He said, just do that. If you do that for me, then come back. Uh, then I can answer your question about why words are so powerful. And, uh, and so the man did it. He went home and he got a, a feather pillow, an old feather pillow, and he cut one end a little bit so he could get at the feathers. And then he very carefully took one feather out of the pillow and placed it on the doorstep of each house in the village. It took him a little while. The next day, he, he came back to the rabbi and he said, okay, rabbi, I, I've done what you asked me to do. Now, why are words so powerful? And, uh, and, and the rabbi said, oh, I have one last thing I need you to do before I can give you an answer. I, I want you to go back throughout the village and collect every single one of those feathers you put out there yesterday. And the guy said, that'd be impossible. The, the feathers have kind of blown all over the place. Who, who knows where they've gone now? I, I could never find them all. And the rabbi stopped and he smiled and he said, now you have your answer. You see, words are powerful. And once we've spoken them, they <laughs> go to all different kinds of places and have all different kinds of effects. And there's literally nothing we can do to take those words back once they've been said. Now, if you have any doubt that words are powerful, take a look at Facebook or Twitter, especially these days. It's nothing more than words. I mean, yeah, there can be some pictures and videos there too, but, but, but you get what I mean. It's, it's just words, right? But those words there have changed people's lives. People have lost their jobs. They've, they've lost their marriages over things that they've posted on Facebook or, or, or put on Twitter. Folks, words are powerful. And that's what this commandment recognizes. You see, as we look back at these last few weeks at the commandments we've studied, one of the things we learn is that God has given us many, many gifts. And each one of these commandments in their own way uh, is set up to protect one of those gifts. For example, uh, God has given us our body, uh, the, the bodies that we have, the lives that we have. And the fifth commandment uh, talked about how we are to help one another protect that gift, the gift of our bodies. God has given us the gift of relationships. And uh, the fourth commandment about honoring our parents or those in authority over us, and the sixth commandment about adultery that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, those help us protect those relationships that God has given us. Last week, Pastor Dave helped us take a look at this idea that God has given us the gift of possessions, of things, material things in this life. And the seventh commandment is designed to help protect those things that God has given us. And finally, this week, we're talking about the fact that there's one more thing God has given us, He's given us the gift of a good reputation, our, our honor, so to speak, uh, what people think about us. And the eighth commandment is designed to help us protect one another's reputation. Now, I said before that I think this may be one of the hardest commandments for us to keep. Why is that? Well, Actually, modern psychology gives us a good perspective on this. I don't know if you've ever heard of this concept before, but, but psychologists talk about something called the fundamental attribution error. I'm going to take a couple minutes to explain this to you, so stick with me here for a minute. You see, what they, what they say is when we think about other people, when we talk about other people, um, there's, there's two different kinds of attribution or, or ways of assigning attributes to them. We can look at someone and we can use what's called dispositional attribution. In other words, we can make 
judgments and ascribe motives uh, and attribute motives to them based on the kind of person we think they are, their disposition. So we might say, well, that person's always happy. They're, they're a great person. They're, they're a nice person. Or we might say, that person's kind of a jerk. That's, those are distributional attributions. Now, the other is what we call situational attribution. In other words, we attribute motives or um, our actions to people, ideas about their character, but we do it based on the situation that they find themselves in, the, the environment they find themselves in. So, so we may say something like, well, they're normally a good person, but they've had a rough time lately. You see, the, the, the circumstances of their life have been difficult lately, and so we're attributing uh, their behavior to their circumstances, not to the kind of person they are. Let me give you an example of that, um, how that kind of works. Imagine you're at the grocery store and uh, you're, you got your mask on and uh, you don't want to spend too much time there, but you need a jar of pickles. And, and you've been up and down every aisle trying to find those pickles. And even though it seems like you've been down every aisle four or five times, you've, you haven't been able to find them. And, and so you walk by the aisle and you see someone that works there stocking the shelves and so you go up to that person and, and you're a little exasperated because you've been looking so long and you're in a hurry and you, and you look at him and you, and you go something like this, you go, excuse me, where are the pickles? Now imagine that person turns and looks at you and they give a big sigh and they roll their eyes and they kind of look at you a little crossly and they point down the aisle about 10 feet away and there are the pickles. And they're like, now, as you walk away from that person, you're going to be thinking, thinking some things uh, about that person. And, uh, and, and if you're going to use dispositional attribution, if you're, you might say something like, what a jerk that guy was. Why, why couldn't he be nice to me? I'm, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I, I, you know, why did he have to roll his eyes at me like that? What, he, what a jerk he is. Or you could use situational attribution. You could look and you could think to yourself, Man, I'm probably about the eighth person that asked him about pickles. Or, um, or I can't imagine what it's like to work in a grocery store and have to wear a mask and have people wearing masks and, and, and have to be in a place where people are coming all the time in public these days. That's got to be tough. Notice how in one case, um, you're ascribing the way he treated you uh, to what kind of person he is. And in the other case, you're ascribing the way he treated you to his situation, not the kind of person. You're assuming he's a good person just having a tough day. Now, here's the really interesting thing that psychologists teach us. When it comes to when we look at ourselves, we tend to always use situational attribution. You know, if we do something wrong, like kind of in an exasperated way, say, where are the pickles? We're like, well, geez, I had looked for them for like 10 minutes and I was really in a hurry and I was scared to be in the grocery store. I'm a good person. I may have been a little cross, but I'm a good person. But when it comes to how we look at others, we almost always, our first instinct is to go to the dispositional attribution. We almost always jump to conclusions about someone's character, about their personality, about the nature of that person. You cut somebody off accidentally in traffic and you go, oops, I'm sorry, man, I don't normally do that. I'm a good driver. They cut you off. It's like, what a jerk. That guy's a terrible driver. We do that all the time. And, and into that circumstance in our lives comes this commandment where God says, you should not bear false witness against your neighbor. And that means publicly or it means personally as well. You see, um, some people just say, well, this commandment's all about lying. We shouldn't tell lies. That's, that's not really what this is about. What, what it's really saying is when it comes to what we think about our neighbors, what we say to ourselves about our neighbor, what we say to others about our neighbor is... That, that we should always assume the best about them and help try to explain their actions, good or bad, in the kindest way. That's the way Luther put it. He said, we should, when it comes to our neighbor, whether they've done something right or done something, even when they've done something wrong, we as individuals should seek to explain everything that they've done in the kindest way we can. Uh, my mom's uh, with the Lord in heaven and has been for a number of years now. But one of the things she taught me from little on, and, and I heard her say it to me year after year in my life, was this. She said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And 
And this commandment helps us understand that doesn't mean just verbally to other people. It means to ourselves as well. So I want to share with you two things that we can do today, practical things that you and I can do to put this commandment into work in our lives. And I guarantee you, it will make your life happier. It will make the lives of people around you better. And again, as I said before, if everyone would do this, if everyone would just do these two things, our lives here in our country would be so much less divided. There'd be so much less uh, animosity, so much less anger in our lives. The first one is this. We need to always assume the best about other people. Always assume that they're doing the best they can in the midst of what may be very difficult circumstances in their lives. Do you know who was really good at doing this? Jesus was. I mean, think about it. Everywhere Jesus went, every one of the stories we see in the Gospels, Jesus is assuming the best about people. I mean, think about it. We, we looked at a story a couple weeks ago of this woman who had been caught in adultery. Jesus assumes the best about her. He doesn't condemn her, he says. He encourages her to make the changes she needs to make in her life so that, so that she can live a more fulfilled life. He doesn't judge her. Think about that story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well we looked at a, a number of weeks ago. Again, this is a woman who's had five husbands and the person she's living with now isn't her husband. She's an outcast in her village. She's a Samaritan and the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. But Jesus looks at her and he assumes the best about her. And again, he doesn't condemn her. In fact, he uses her to evangelize a whole village. Here's a, a few other examples. Think about Jesus in that story of Zacchaeus. Again, one we looked at not that long ago here on a Sunday morning. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He, he's someone who's taking advantage of the, the people for his own personal gain and conspiring with the local uh, Roman occupying forces. He's an outcast in his village too. He has to climb up a tree to see Jesus because no one will let him through the crowd. But Jesus assumes the best about him and goes to his house and has dinner with him and his family. Think, think about the, the Roman centurion that comes to Jesus with a, with a servant who's ill. Again, the, the Romans were the occupying army there. They, they treated people cruelly, but Jesus assumes that this centurion is a good guy and, and he's, he's willing to, to help heal his servant. Think about Jesus and the 12 disciples. Again, they were from all different walks of life, but, but none of them were like leaders in the society. There were fishermen and tax collectors. One of them, Jesus even knew from the beginning, was going to betray him. But Jesus assumes the best about them, and he calls them to be his disciples, and he invests in their lives for, for three years. And, and after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, those disciples changed the world with the good news about Jesus. Jesus assumed the best about people even though he knew sometimes the worst. Paul teaches us this, all have sinned. All of us, each and every one of us is not perfect. We all have faults and failings, some pretty big ones. All of us have sinned. In fact, in the chapter leading up to these verses in Romans chapter 3, Paul says there is no one who is good. No one does right. He says their, their, their mouths are just like like empty tombs and, and he just goes on and on about how broken we are as human beings all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god but then paul reminds us we have all been justified by god's grace as a gift through the redemption that redemption that is ours through christ jesus yeah we're all broken people jesus knew that and yet he always looked for the good in people instead of calling out the bad. What if we did that? There are some jerks in the world around us. There are some people that are difficult to deal with. There are people that do some really nasty things. But what if we all, as individuals, assumed the best about people? Tried to see the best in them the way Jesus did. And, uh, and that's the second thing that we need to do. If we are going to uh, put this commandment into work in our lives, we need to try to see people 
the way Jesus saw them. You know, I, I think there's an event in Jesus' life, a, a, a thing that happened to Jesus and something he said as a result that is the exact opposite of the fundamental attribution error. In, in fact, it's like the polar opposite of it. It's Jesus showing us exactly how to do it and how not to do it. And we find it in Luke chapter 23. In verse 13, we're told this. It says, Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And why did he do that? Because those chief priests and rulers and people had brought Jesus to Pilate to be crucified. The the religious officials, um, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they said, that's it. If, if we don't do something about this Jesus, we're going to lose our position and our authority. The Roman government is going to uh, take everything we have away from us. We have to stop him. And the only way we can stop him is to have him killed. And so they arrest Jesus, even though they n- knew he had done nothing wrong. And they create a fake trial with fake witnesses. And, uh, and then they find him guilty and they bring him before Pilate and they say, we have found this man guilty. We want you to execute him. Now, at first Pilate thinks, maybe I can just have him beaten and, and they'll be okay with that. So he has Jesus flogged uh, mercilessly to within an inch of his life. And, th- and then he, he brings Jesus back and, uh, and he puts him before those religious leaders and the chief priests and the people. And he says, okay, now what do you want me to do with this Jesus? And you know what they say? That's not enough. We need you to crucify him. We need him to die. And so Pilate, even though he knows Jesus is innocent, finally agrees. And we're told later in that chapter in uh, verse 34, it says, And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him. And look what Jesus says. He, he looks at the religious leaders who have conspired to have him killed. He, he looks at the people who have supported those religious leaders and shouted, crucify him. And he says this, he prays this prayer. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, in one sense, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew they were having an innocent man killed. The religious leaders knew they were doing it for their own benefit, for their own protection. The the people knew they were doing it because it was a spectacle. But Jesus also knows that in one sense, they don't know what they're doing. They don't realize they are crucifying the Son of God. He looks at them and he says, Father, forgive them. Folks, what, what if we tried to see people the way Jesus sees them? What if, what if every person we saw, whether they were posting something on Facebook that made us angry or, or that we violently disagree with or, 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 or were retweeting things that we wish they had never retweeted or, or whether they were saying something to us in person or writing something about us somewhere else or, 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 or just answering a question that we ask at the grocery store in a way that makes us feel bad? What if, what if no matter who it was, we tried to remember that, yeah, they're broken, they're sinful just like we are, but they're loved by God. They're forgiven by God. Jesus died for them just like he did for us. And, and what if we were to pray that prayer? Father, forgive them. They, they don't understand what they're doing. They're, I'm sure their circumstances are horrible. I'm sure they're having a bad day. I'm, sh- I, I'm sure they just don't understand. What if we put the best construction, the, explained in the best possible way their actions? What if we never said anything unless it was something nice? And if we couldn't say something nice, we didn't say anything at all. Did you, did you hear that, Mom? What if we tried to see people through Jesus' eyes. Our world would be a dramatically better place. Amen. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one for the one for whom you loved and gave your son for humanity increase my love help me to love with open arms like you do 
give life but your words also remind us that we fall short we so, we fall so very short of what you call us to but that word reminds us that what you ask us to do is not in our own strength but in the strength of the spirit that lives in us your laws and your commands are that reminder that we must rely on you, that we need a Savior. Father, the sin that is within us is great, but you are greater still. Father, in this time, in this moment, we confess to you those sins. And at the same time, your word testifies that those sins have been paid for, that Jesus died for those sins once and for all on Calvary. And it's the faith that you've given us that keeps us steady, that marks us as righteous, that marks us as forgiven. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have again today in Jesus. We thank you for the righteousness that we have in Jesus. 
Father, today we also gather here at the beginning of August. And we want to lift up to you today a special prayer for all of the students that are heading back to school, whether here locally or online, and those students that are headed back to college or there for the very first time. We want to lift up to you the teachers that are trying to navigate this time. And Father, we lift up to you the parents who are this time wishing they'd paid more attention in math class. We ask you to strengthen them. We ask you to give them patience. We ask you to give them strength. We ask you to look over those students that leave us. Keep them safe. Keep those teachers safe, students safe. We also lift up prayers for those that are working on vaccines that you would continue to guide their hands and bring one quickly, Lord Jesus. And we pray to you this morning the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, as I said earlier, this is a communion service. And it's at this time that we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So if you have your bread and your wine, I would ask you to Get them out at this moment. You know, the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night that he was taken before the Sanhedrin and tried for crimes, witness after witness bore false witness against Jesus. They came and made false accusations, accusations that didn't add up. But then we're told, Jesus testified, telling the truth about who he was. And it was for telling the truth, for not sinning, that Jesus was crucified. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice needed for the sins of the world. Dying in our stead, the perfect lamb. And that night that he was betrayed, he took bread in the meal. And when he had broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Then, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had blessed, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink of this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink. For those of you that did not commune this morning, and for the children that are present here this morning, I would love to speak this blessing over you. I pray that the Lord continue to grow you in the knowledge of him, that he continue to grow your your excitement over him, your knowledge in him, your desire to know him, that that would continue to well up in you. I pray that he keep you until life everlasting. And my prayer for all of you this morning is that this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Strengthen and keep you in the one true faith until time after everlasting. Amen. We continue our service with one last worship song. Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers. 
But all an empty world can sell is empty dreams I got lost in the light when it was up to me To make a name the world remembers But Jesus is the only name to remember Thank you for joining us online today. And we look forward to meeting you here again next week or outdoors at one of our four sites. But as you leave here today, I would love to send you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift you up and give you his peace. Amen. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Jesus is the only name.